I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total liberation. I forgot this line. But I will permit my fear to not bother me and look through my mind's eye. Ah, fuck it. Oh, well. Uh, Harry and Mark, middle ground catching. I don't know. Thank you for calling. <laughs> We'll be with you shortly. Now, folks, thank you for tuning in to Hitting the Mark with Harry and Mark. I'm your co-host, Mark, and this is my co-host, Harry. Hello. And we're two idiots who love talking about shit. We have no idea what we're talking about. We hope you're doing well this week. Um, just an announcement, just because of the uh, the fact that we're shills for Marvel, uh, and there are no Marvel uh, entries at the moment, we're going to be going back to Thursday podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know the world is our oyster you know fucking there's only one of you listening so like we could do this any fucking time we want but just for the sake of uh the sake of clarity we'll probably do this every thursdays again until uh the loki series comes back and i think that's in about eight weeks cool so there we go harry Mm -hmm. how was your day how you know what how was your week my week is uh my week is all right. I uh, went back to work after vacation. Um, um, uh, had to get back into motion to uh you know get used to getting up early and going to work. Um, but uh, it was cool. A uh, pretty slow week. Um, uh, continue. I don't know if I already said it, but I'm like watching the Marvel movies from the beginning, like from Iron Man Hi. and Thor. So, so last time we talked, you were on Thor. Which one are you on now? We are almost through Avengers. So we finished Captain America. We started Avengers, and we're like, we're back. We're in that part where all the enemy armies are coming through that portal. That's where we stopped off. Gotcha, gotcha. Hmm? What did you think of um, the first Avenger? So it was actually the first time I think I said that. Um, I haven't seen Captain America: First Avenger um before so watching it for the first time was it was uh interesting um i think what what was bothering me for most of the movie because it's only like the first half of it uh when um gavin rick is like in his smaller body before he gets the serum Uh uh-huh just the way they like tried to blend his face or head onto the yeah. body was a little, yeah. little bad, a little bad, but, um, it gets, it gets a little better in winter soldier. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, that was about it. Other than that, I think it was cool. Uh, it was a great way to see, I guess what was cool was seeing a lot of references that are said now, mm-hmm. uh, about things that happened then. Um, right. It's funny because uh, in Avengers, when Captain America is talking about uh, like Hydra and then like how they uh, how shield is like has like Hydra weapons and stuff and all that. Um, like I didn't get that. I was just like, well, I don't know what that is, but whatever. Um, now I do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was cool. Um, it makes a little more sense. They definitely mm-hmm. laid the groundwork fairly straightforward in this one. Yeah. So, um, but even like a lot of things that happen, like our reference, like for example, the, the series we just finished watching, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, where, um, uh, Bucky's talking about, have you ever, you know, threw yourself onto a live grenade? You know, like mm-hmm. I get that reference because in the original one, uh, uh, Captain Steve Rogers jumps onto a live grenade that's dropped thinking it was live but it was actually a decoy but he was the only one who jumped on top of it so no one else got hurt exactly so, another one of those i think that's always the the one that you and i go to a lot the the have you ever jumped on a grenade criteria for captain america mm-hmm. yeah like i didn't understand it until i watched it oh okay okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think um i think for me the first half of Captain America, I think, is exceptional. Mm-hmm. Like the uh, understanding who Steve Rogers is, building up a bit of the tension with uh, with uh, uh, Red Skull. Yeah, uh, his his um, 
becoming the super soldier and then kind of that disappointing avenue he goes where he becomes well the uh the john walker character kind of mirrors him where he's kind of just like a shill for the american uh uh military industrial complex yeah and you know he's like you know what fuck this i'm (laughs) i'm gonna go save my friend and then that's kind of i think where the story gets a little eh because Mm -hmm. it's then just plot 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 the entire first half is a lot of like character development a lot of deconstruction of like okay well how do we make steve rogers like likable in this way true yeah so, but i'm 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 interested in seeing how far you get to with uh with the with the next uh batch of these movies yeah uh, i'm gonna see how far i get to because you know um been watching like, you maybe like the incredible hulk right the originals no 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 the the 2009 hulk movie uh is that with Edward Norton, Edward Norton, Norton okay. Kerr, yeah. Tyler, with Abomination. Yes. Mm-hmm. When Emil Blanc, he's doing all those backflips and he shoots the dog. Yeah. And this is before the Marvel movies really had their like slapstick geopolitical, like middle of the road kind of mm-hmm. uh, ideology. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's one thing that I liked about the continuation of the Marvel movies, at least with, you know, the first phase is that they didn't like make a incredible Hulk like movie. Cause there's already like, no, there's one already out not too long ago. Right. So they're right. kind of like, why should we make another one when there's, there's two already, you know? So there's like, mm, is there really a reason to make a third, you know? Um, and I think, I think that was cool that they didn't do that. And I love that in Thor, I don't know if I mentioned it, but they uh, actually mentioned Bruce Banner's name. What, or no, they don't mention his name, but they reference him. Mm-hmm. Um, when um, the scientist is talking about S.H.I.E.L.D. and he's saying, I knew a scientist who was like a pioneer in gamma radiation and just mm-hmm. like... You know, Shield got him, and he never was heard of again. I'm like, oh, I know who he's talking about. <laughs> Galore. Yeah. So yeah. that was cool. Um, but so far, I th- going from you know Iron Man, Iron Man two, uh, Thor, and then Captain America into Avengers. It's, I think, I, it's, I think it's different watching them when they're like year or two off from each other, you know? Um Instead it's just of months. Yeah, like right now like you know, I'm watching them, you know, kind of back to back, so I kind of I'm like seeing the pro- progression of the um uh of the uh of the story like, oh, okay, like you know, I'm going from Iron Man to Iron Man 2 and then straight to Thor and then straight to Captain America, straight to Avengers. You know, I kind of see the storyline progressing and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, and yeah, I, I, I still like, I still like how they did it. Like, I'm liking it more because I'm getting a lot of the references that are mentioned in later movies and also, uh, just, um, yeah, I think it's just that fine tune comb. Yes. Um, but you're right. Also, I think uh, when you're talking about the uh, where movies are coming out like months from from you know months apart from each other, that also mm-hmm. is kind of like, you know, but I I guess it makes sense once you get enough characters in a universe, you know, going, it kind of like to continue the story. Like well, for example, like um, was it uh, Ant Man and the Wasp? Like it, there was um, like it wasn't really involved with the rest of the Avengers. It was kind of like their own thing. And then also um, at the ending, you know, you kind of see what is basically transpiring with the next movie. Right. So, or, or what was happening at, while everything was happening, like this was happening with Ant-Man and the Wasp. So it's, right. it's kind of cool to see that. It's kind of like a, with what the, um, what the series are doing, kind of like the background story, you know, I think it's pretty cool. Cause he obviously, he uh Ant Man is a big factor when it comes to Endgame, right? Mm-hmm. He's the one who does the whole quantum physics f- physics kind of stuff. So, 
Um, I think that was cool. Um, but I'm excited to see, you know, the later movies. Um, especially ones that I enjoyed a lot, like uh, Thor Ragnarok and uh, Galaxies of the Guardian. It's per- yeah. Damn straight. No, no, Galaxies. I said that Guardian. backwards. Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, no, you said that just fucking right. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. Um, Taking up been... after me. And I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I've been, uh, that's what I've been doing this week. Uh, just uh, working and then just eating and then doing that. That's it. How's how's your week been? My week has been symbolically awful. Mm-hmm. So, fucking the beginning of this week, uh, I've been I've been taking up a nine to five job. I'm typically mm-hmm. a bartender, server, that kind of thing, and I'm doing a, a different job now. Where, uh, as my girlfriend calls it, you're like everyone else. So I'm doing nine to five mm-hmm. work and all that shit, and it's kind of it's kind of awful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm no like stranger to working like long hours, working like constantly and day to day and that kind of thing. But like, just the the office work is like kind of you know forehead to the the cheese grater. But here's this really great bit, right? Mm-hmm. So it's Monday night and I'm watching Star Trek, and it just so mm-hmm. happens that it's the episode when Q becomes human q is this omnipotent being who's like Mm -hmm. a trickster asshole but he becomes human right and he fucking hates being human Mm. and i couldn't help but feel like there was a parallel there not trying to mix my metaphors i don't have a god complex not all the time (laughs) but, but like being put into something that you're not quite accustomed to and then talking on a podcast about it. It's exactly like Star Trek. And then, yeah. as we're speaking now, we're watching the famous reunification episode that I was telling you about. Mm-hmm. So when we talked about Star Trek Discovery, I mentioned the uh, reunification three, where we talked about how Romulus and and uh, Vulcan uh, reunited in between... Uh, their 900 year gap right yes so it's called reunification three because in next generation the next generation series um picard meets spock's father um who is basically going through vulcan dementia it's called bendai syndrome or bendu bendai syndrome and he's like hey i want to speak to my son spock and they're not on good terms, right? right? So he finds out that Spock is on Romulus, essentially teaching like a small group of people like the way of Sarek, the the logic uh, ideology that the Vulcans are keen on. Okay. And right before we got on the fucking phone together, I was like, man, I am so scatterbrained right now. I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. And I was thinking to myself, I feel exactly like fucking Spock's dad. Fucking, I have Ben Do syndrome, Ben Die syndrome. I'm, I'm going insane. That's it. That's it. That's terrible. And it sucks. It's fucking heartbreaking because Vulcans technically live like two times as long as as humans, and wow. this disease he has just like more slowly than dementia. And dementia is fucking awful. I know. Uh, <laughs> this fucking thing is going to eat him like eat at him longer than it would a normal human. Yeah. So, yeah, that fucking blows. Anyway, um, that's my fucking week. Just putting my head against the grinder and watching episodes of Star Trek that just happened to be making my life feel even worse about myself. Huh. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, fucking, I waited for my paycheck, and I'm getting some epoxy resin to finish this fucking project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fuck you. I'm getting everything in bulk. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I know. You can never be too careful with these things. And I finally, finally started fiddling with my airbrush. So Ooh. now you're going to get spotty paint all over everything now. Watch. Just watch. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I can see it. Yeah. 
Anywho. Um, so let's talk about Mortal Kombat. Just to get it out of the way. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you my thoughts first, and then Please. you can, um, just shit all over your opinion. Yeah, exactly. So I thought it was a fun watch. Um, okay. Uh, I liked the first like quarter of it. Is it even the quarter? Let's just say the, um, the very beginning. That the was dope. Step. Yeah. Thought it was good. Um, I don't like, I guess I get it that like Scorpion's the, uh, the focus. Cause you know, everyone knows who Scorpion is. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I just, there's some really cheesy lines that were pretty cringy. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think there's plenty of those. Um, I think the overall story, they had a good idea. Um, you're right. Kano was like the <laughs> Kano wins. <laughs> it was a fucking beauty. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Kano was like the best part of that movie. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I, think I, I don't know what else to say about it. Like, it was a fun watch, but like, I definitely oh, won't. How about just tell me how you feel? Like, just tell me like simple shit that you liked. Like, it doesn't have to be like a deep dive. You got me for shit like that, and you can occasionally disagree or agree with me if I open yeah, my mouth. Like, like just tell me how you felt. I like the Scorpion storyline with Sub Zero. I think it was super cheesy that like he was like, "I am now known as Sub Zero." It was kind of lame. Um, yeah. and yeah. then like Scorpion saying like, English. yeah, like, and then him saying like, I'm known as Scorpion now. Like what? Like, I don't know. It's just, no, it's, it's what we were talking about. Right. Yeah. Where it's like the only reason they're saying that is because it's Mortal Kombat and we're supposed to know that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also Again, the storyline was great. I think it was a great storyline. Um, it's a good concept of like you know people are chosen to fight. You can earn the mark by killing things. Um, I thought that was a cool little concept, um, especially how people get their, you know, I guess entrances to, you know, the battles or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, it seems like it's gonna be. A continuation because of Johnny Cage, and I'm sure there's hella other fucking, like there's plenty of other fighters that ha- that weren't introduced right away. Um, I don't know. I didn't like the main characters. I just didn't like the main character. Yeah. Like I, I didn't really know what was gonna happen with them. I thought I don't know if they were gonna like turn into Scorpion or if they were you know whatever like. I really had no idea, and I just didn't like where it ended. Like, like what? That's his super power. Like, I think that's yeah, another a, thing. That, a like, sweater. Yeah, and it's just the, the quote unquote like how like you gain your powers by like doing this. Like, you know what I mean? Like in training, I'm just like, oh, what? Like that's what? That's yeah. pretty lame. Like, I you should already have, you know, like. You, I don't know. That's just things that, like, yeah, this movie wasn't that fucking great. Like, it was fun to watch once, but I'm not gonna rewatch it. It's not. It's not one of those movies. Um. Uh. Yeah. I mean, that's. There's probably more, but f- for the time being, Kano was fun. Um, the gore w- was. I mean, I felt like it. It did more. I felt more like the game than the originals did. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not super like, I know people are going to talk about the fight scenes, but I'm not a, an expert when it comes to that. I you just, don't listen to me. You, you, okay, buddy, I gotta yes. be honest with you. You, you. We gotta level. Turn this shit off. No. Yep. Just tell me how you feel. Just, just fucking tell me how you feel. And then try thinking of, like, well, is what I'm saying constructive? And that's, whenever I talk 
about like a show for mm-hmm. the most part. That's what I say. Like, oh, I didn't like how this looked. Well, that's not really constructive. That me, not I'm not like paraphrasing mm-hmm. it. But like if you don't like something from the way it looks, that's perfectly fine. I think people are smart enough to know that that's a preference. Mm-hmm. But like if you're saying, wow, this thing had really bad pacing issues or like, oh, the the message that they were doing or oh the directing like that's still a preference but you're trying to to insert some sense Mm. of 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 consideration into how the film was made Mm. whether or not it's a preference you're trying to use an educate educated understanding of what's going on and that's perfectly fine man just just start with how you feel and then that's 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 your job in this podcast (laughs) yeah yeah. you know okay shut the fuck up shut the you know it's my turn Mm-hmm. I think the biggest fucking mistake was killing Kano. Okay, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. mate. No, um, I think the guy who plays Kano is the only one who understands what kind of fucking movie he's in. Yeah, like I think we're in the alternate dimension where, like, okay, hold on. <laughs> it's almost like Kano that we know in this movie yeah. was actually written in another dimension where the Mortal Kombat movie was actually good. Oh. And they just switched dimensions. So the other dimension that had the really good Mortal Kombat had a really weak and disappointing Kano. Yes. And we got their Kano. Yeah. Um. Okay. I'm going to completely agree with you on the, the first, like, the first act. Mm-hmm. I think... The opening introducing um, Hanzo, Asha- Hanzo Hasashi and I know they say Bihan. I'm going to say Bihan because Bihan sounds cooler. And I heard them say Bihan in the Mortal Kombat web show. Mm. So fuck you, not you, Harry. Yep. Um, I thought that was interesting. Um, they implied that there was a little more depth to Sub Zero, but like the way that they make him out to be in this is like just terminator badass and that actually i think worked in a really interesting way that i never thought would happen like ever ever like there's this really great moment when um when jack shoots the shotgun uh right into sub-zero's face and he freezes it and the actor's expression in his eyes like that playful like contempt and the head tilt like it just it works and he's yeah. so good at it um 10 points to gryffindor for the actor who plays byhan like he does a shitload of work with just the top half of his face just yeah. expressing and emoting a lot of of intensity and like playfulness that you don't like that you haven't seen any Mortal Kombat. Um, I absolutely loved the uh, the first fight, the first fight with uh, Jax and uh, Sub Zero, like when they're in the alleyway, and there's like this beautiful, like light blue and orange clash lighting, and he goes in and he's investigating. It's like, oh, this is kind of creepy. Like, oh, he's gonna fucking pop out of nowhere, mm. and that fight is really cool and it's well done um and every other fucking fight scene just eats ass in my opinion mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh god i feel like such an asshole about it um mm-hmm. i'm i'm really disappointed i i don't know how mm-hmm. to put it like the trailer really hyped this movie up and it did i'm not the kind of guy to be like this is the movie Harry, Harry, look at me, Harry. This yep, is the movie, the best video game movie. I'm, I'm never like that. I'm like, right. okay, it's a video game movie. I watched the trailer and I'm like, oh wow, this looks pretty fucking good. And yeah. I don't know. I was like, I was expecting John Wick style action sequences, and I was expecting something a little more than like the bare minimum in story. Like, what? Bo- I like, I get it. I get it. Like. I'm talking about film critique on a Mortal Kombat movie. Yeah. But, like, 
it, it, it ended up just being Mortal Com- I mean, uh, Power Rangers, that fucking Sabin <laughs> films, Power Rangers film, where it's like, they just modernize everything. They don't like, they don't put effort into like the story or the characters or anything like that. Mm-hmm. They just modernize it. Good thing I never seen it. You, you're not missing it. Okay, so back on track. I liked the first third. I liked the first third because it, it gave a sense of promise. Yes. Like the the set like I don't know. The setup for uh Jax and Sub Zero, I think, is the best fight. It has a great sense of tone, it has a great mm-hmm. sense of visual contrast. Um it sets up like the fatalities thing really well. Um mm-hmm. and then they go straight into fucking Kano, Sonya Blade, and new guy versus reptile and reptile is like uh yeah and it's is that even reptile it is but it's like you know what i think it is i think the fact that you and i don't play mortal Kombat, we're used to the the scorpion in green kind of get up yeah right fair enough yeah um i don't know i i know that in the the games he's not like scorpion in green now like he is kind of like an actual like crocodile dude but it would have benefited from a physical character i think yeah um the rest of the story is them just waiting it's it's just it's just treading water uh which i think is a little disappointing where it's like oh yeah you've got a train Da da da. Let's do a couple quick montages, and then the shit hits the fan, and then you have your arbitrary like weakest point or lowest point, and then like nothing. Then it's just your last fight. Um, I think, despite what I've been saying, the biggest disappoint from disappointment for me was Shang Tsung. Mm. Uh, the the sorcerer, the the soul snatcher. Yeah. Uh, the actor who played him in the first one is so like I get he's campy and he's like eating the scenery, yes. but like your soul is mine. Like that, like emphasis he puts in that performance is so goddamn good for that movie. Yes, like I get here he's like the overlord like character and he's got some geopolitical shit to deal with and all that, but like there's no menace. He's just he's he's important because the script tells you he's important and it's not like he does anything particularly interesting or engaging mm-hmm. or like intimidating um which breaks my heart cuz like the actor who plays Shang Tsung is in the games like his likeness is in the fucking video games and then he re plays Shang Tsung in the TV show or the the web show mm. which is so good like all things said and done um okay back on track so they get to the um they get to the the second act which i think is like probably the weakest i think mm-hmm. yeah it's really bad um we're introduced to Kung Lao who is over costumed he's got these really bad shoulder pauldrons but like when they're doing the training, he has like his regular not pauldron outfit on and he looks so much better. Yeah. Uh, Liu Kang is in it and he's reduced to like, uh, I don't know. I feel like he just shouldn't have been in it. Like introduce him in the next one. Mm. Um, But he has this part where it's like, he doesn't really have anything to do. Like Kung Lao for some reason is introduced as like, the the great uniter like they do this thing where he dies fucking spoiler alert um he dies at the end of the second act and they're all like oh god what are we gonna do without him and i'm like what (laughs) wait what when was he like the leader like i get like he was the disciple of of uh raiden with uh with Liu kang and they were doing their thing together but like there was nothing other than just training with him. There was no camaraderie. There was no real anything other than the one like, oh, hey, Kano, I got my powers. <laughs> you give me a fucking egg roll. Like, other yeah. than that one scene, like, you're really going to, like, make me want to feel bad for this guy. Like, it's Mortal Kombat. You you go through as many characters as possible. Like, yeah. 
there are a select few characters that anyone actually cares about. You know who they are. Make them the main characters and like have quippy, funny lines, do shorthand to get to know these characters, but just kill them or whatever. Um, I just thought it was weird. Like they, they did nothing to make this guy likable other than just like training. Um, they took a shitload of characters that like they just killed for no reason nothing yeah. like there was um god there's reiko uh the vampire chick i, I got it's so weird it's like i think after mortal kombat 3 i just don't know anyone which is so strange yeah um, and here's the thing there are like 50 or 60 Mortal Kombat characters. Well, there are probably more than that, but they're like a shitload of Mortal Kombat characters. And I think what would have been really interesting is if you took all of the C tier Mortal Kombat characters and you just put them in this first movie. Mm. Like, introduce all of the characters everyone fucking hates to begin with and just put them on each every side. Like, mm. I think that would have been more interesting than like throwing in all the characters that you already know like right. jacks like, oh of course the guy with the arms sonya blade oh cool i wonder who they're teasing at the end of mortal kombat one he's from hollywood oh <laughs> like sure yeah kung lao raiden and all that but it's like i'd really like to see them do something and they don't get the chance um back on track so what i like is that um the uh outworld has been essentially cheating i kind of like that idea like yeah we're not at mortal Kombat. everyone's bitching about like oh we didn't see any mortal Kombat. we didn't see the tournament i'm like i don't i don't care i i don't yeah. i like <sighs> i know this would be different if i was a fan but like i i don't need there to be the mortal Kombat. i like the idea that these guys are cheating and they're picking off like earth's earth's warriors and all we have is this pissant crew of idiots um like i enjoy that and i think that's fair i mean i think it makes a little more sense to make a fucking five movie deal starting with that how they're like doing some like shady shit like fucking shit up um so yeah uh kong lao dies uh they go to why didn't (laughs) so fucking is it raiden raiden takes them to uh this place between outworld and earth for them to train it's basically the hyperbolic time chamber and like he's like this is where we can hide i'm like why didn't you just take them there in the fucking first place to train mm-hmm. like it, i get it i get it like listen to me i i understand it's the same thing as godzilla versus kong where it's like it's just it's just dumb fun but it's like if it's not even engaging, like, what's the point? Because it's yeah. like, <clears throat> you have who, the, the Reiko, the, the big fucking warlike dude with the hammer. His fight yep. with Jax is fucking awful. And it highlights something that I was really, really, like, gaslighting myself about, which was the fucking fight scenes are awful. Yeah. Like, in every conceivable way. Like... They just do, like, these PG fights that are poorly, like, one, they're poorly choreographed, and two, they're poorly fucking shot. Mm. Like, every time we get a stunt going on, it's like, quick cut, quick cut, quick cut. And we don't get, like, a sense of, like, what I liked about the first movie is that, one, during its time, it had similar cuts but it actually had martial artists kind of like doing their thing and the cuts weren't as frequent. So you could see these guys kind of fucking with each other. Right. Right. Um, here, I don't know. It just, it feels performative. And then especially mm. when you get to the sub zero, uh, scorpion fight, it's just two dudes in bulky costuming, like fucking with one another. I don't know. Like, Say what you will about the outfits and costumes from Mortal Kombat 1, but at least they didn't seem restrictive or weighed down. When I see mm-hmm. fucking um, the stunt actor playing 
or, or I don't know, it could be um, the actor who's playing Hanzo at that time. But when I see the guy playing Sub Zero and the guy playing like uh, I almost said Scarecrow, <laughs> uh, Scorpion in that mm-hmm. last fight scene, it's just, it's just like bulky, uncomfortable movement in these overly bulky outfits. Like, I don't know how to explain it. I really don't. Like, there's so much that I feel like I just got, like, the worst reach around possible on, you know? Yeah. Um, But because it's something I noticed, and I had to mention it, uh, fucking Scorpion takes off his mask, like, five times to do, like, nothing. Yeah, that was annoying. He's like, mask off. You'll remember this face. Puts it back on. Takes his mask off. Does the fire thing. Puts it on. Takes his mask off. Looks at his like his fucking air. Oh yeah, I'm I'm your friend. Something something back on. And he's it- speaking in Japanese, and I don't think the main character knows Japanese. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm well confused about that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. They didn't well, like they wanted to do some cute bullshit in the beginning where it's like, oh, oh, that's cool, so cool. Like, so Bai Han is like Mandarin or or like something. Yeah, and uh, like they wanted to give like these characters a sense of like nationality, and that's really fucking cool. And then yeah. you realize that there's nothing to it. There's really nothing fucking to it. Fucking Bai Han speaks English in a planet universe where there is no fucking English, but that's fine. It's fine doesn't fucking matter but now like he's speaking japanese to a guy who doesn't speak japanese whatever i will say that i will fucking say this yes this has the largest um cast of color multiracial cast Mm. ever no not ever but like for an american production huge non-white asian cast that's something to be proud of um we need more of that because these guys actually really did a good job. I think the choreography needs a lot of work. Yeah. I'd like to see another one um, where I think they, they get... Because this was, you know, this was well-viewed. This is, you know, fans are going to love it. I just hope they throw a little more money at it and put a little more effort into some of the um, the choreography. I yes. really want to see the costumes refined so that function takes more uh, of a front seat. Because that's one of the things that I think hit me the hardest. Like, I can understand something like, um, like Kung Lao, where it's like, right. oh, he has this big fucking hat. But, I don't know, they still even could have done something with him, where it's like, you'd have this really cool bit where it's like, he's literally trained to fight with a big metal sh- sharp ass hat on top of him, right? Yep. That would be really fucking cool to, like, see a martial arts fight where it's like, he fights a very specific way. Like he fights upright and like outreaches and like he blocks with the hat or some fucking shit. Right. But like, you don't see anything like that because everything's rushed because we don't have the time because it's like, we have to get to the fatalities of fucking Jack's like destroying this guy's head when like, there's no really enjoyable fight that I think I actually liked about the previous movie more. Like, Mm -hmm. I remember all these characters doing front flips, back flips, and shit like that, and 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 I'm like, wow, that's really fucking cool. They put the effort into doing shit like that, even though it's a you know a shitty movie. It's still a shitty movie, but like, there's a a quality in the martial arts that isn't quite there in this one that I feel like the other products still have. Like the um the whole thing that got this shit lifted off the ground. Um, the Mortal Kombat Retribution, or is it Retribution? The the show in the web show in 2010, or the, oh, the early yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot which one, but yes, uh, uh, Jai Michael White or Michael J White, uh, Jerry Ryan, like they had some solid names doing these parts. They introduced Baraka, um. Uh, Kyra or Cyrax and Sector, like there was mm. some really cool shit going on with this, and it's like, uh, Michael J. White is an actual martial artist and kickboxer, mm. like or not kickboxer, but he's an actual martial artist. The guy who played Spawn, yeah, and some of his stuff is absolutely fucking great, 
and the way they frame it is like this pulpy like i don't know i just i see that and then i watch this and i'm like first of all you had almost 30 years to learn your lesson and not only that but you had like 10 years to learn your lesson on that yeah because i think at the end of the day it's just a hodgepodge of of a movie trying to like do the whole reference thing like oh yeah kind of when i know i said that it's the best fucking line in the movie but it's it's but it's like, oh yeah, kind of wins, or like flawless victory, or oh, god, yeah, yeah, like I don't know. I've never been so disappointed by a trailer. I thought the trailer was going to be fucking John Wick meets Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I swear to God, mm-hmm. like, like hero Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and John Wick, where it's like really well shot, long paced, long shot action sequences. Uh, we don't need to fucking worry about the characters. Just establish them and show the fucking fight scenes. Mm-hmm. Like the, the the oh oh god, you're getting your ass kicked in the ring. You need to mind your surroundings. Da da da. And then like what? Oh, he learns the moral of the story. Mind your fucking surroundings at the end of the movie. Right. Oh god. And it's like I was saying, like the fact that they introduce all the characters, almost all of the characters that you know in the movie. And just kill almost all of them is huh. disappointing. Because it's like Goro. Goro's fucking oh god. The fight scene with him yeah. is so awful. And like they just throw him out there. He's like I, I get like Oh man, I, I don't even know. Like, there is so much wasted potential in this movie. Like Mylena, Mylena just gets fucking thrown to the wind. Like Shang Tsung is like, oh, here's my beautiful winged harpy vampire girlfriend. And you obviously know she's going to die. She's the fucking first one to die because she's nothing but CG. Yep. But like, man, I-, I don't even like Mortal Kombat. Like, of course, I liked when it was a fucking uh, an old ass like one and two that you could play. But like, I don't yeah. give a fuck. But like they got me really fucking excited for this movie and they brought a really great fucking actor Japanese actor to play fucking Scorpion and they like they just teased you and they pulled the fucking Godzilla yeah. it's like oh wait here's this really great performance no let's just fucking get rid of him nope nah I don't know man I ugh. it just gets me yep yeah. alright what's your score I give it a 6 out of 10 no 5 out of 10 no I give I give it a six. I give it a six. I give it a six mainly for Kano. Cause mm. fucking <sighs> I don't even want to talk about all of the characters. Like mm. like why? Why would they spend actual time giving Sonya Blade a character arc? Like I'm not saying like don't give people character arcs, but they literally give her like the worst possible character arc. Mm-hmm. Oh man, you'll you're not worthy. And then she fucking kills Kano. Oh nice, I'm worthy because I'm a murderer. Like uh... yeah, six out of ten. Kano prevents it from being a five. Yep. And they I'm still him. gonna I'm still gonna give it a five he... because they killed him. Yeah, I just I feel like they. Uh, he literally should have been like the Loki of this. Sh- this series like the not anti-hero like you can literally have him do the shit that he does in this movie where it's like oh i was kind of meant to be the the guardian or the 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 tournament warrior right and i just Mm. nope i'm not i'm not feeling it no and just like just fucking do that like keep that for like three movies i don't get the idea just fucking killing him off when he's the funniest like he's literally the reason i'm on like attention mode when I'm watching this because my eyes started fucking glazing over after like the first sparring match and then nothing nothing of what these fucking people say is interesting they literally have the generic Sonya Blade goes up to the the guy and asks about the kids thing and I'm just like "Mm." 
give me Kano. Kano is the only funny one in this movie. Yeah. And I don't even like Kano all that much. Like, seriously. Ah, oh, God damn it. I'm sorry. I've been... Fine. This is a good seg- segue to, um, to our next topic. What fucking no. topic? Is it it's Kano? Not... Is it all about Kano? <laughs> no. Um, you wanted to talk to me about a movie um, that reminded you of another movie. Okay, so I've um because I've had nothing better to do, I've been watching HBO. Uh and on their app is a uh or on their streaming app is a movie called Cast a Deadly Spell. Hmm. Cast a Deadly Spell is literally just film noir, the detective stories in the 30s and 40s, but okay. with magic and fantasy creatures. Huh. So, like, they they put no effort into the story at all. It's literally just... It's the 1930s LA, and there are also monsters, ghosts, ghouls, and magic. Okay. And this actually got me kind of interested because it reminded me of Bright. Okay. So one of the big criticisms that I hear a lot and that I also share with Bright is that like the world design is really fucking awful. Mm. Um so like in this world Orcs, elves, all magical fuck folk have existed the entire time. And like 2,000 years ago, around the time of what we would consider like the era of Christian Christness, there's like a elven dark lord who's basically like fucking Morgoth or uh, Sauron, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the orcs bow down to him and whatever, and he's defeated, and that's why the orcs have a bad rap. And now everything is the exact same, right? So right. basically, think of Lord of the Rings happening, and 2,000 years, Gondor becomes L.A. Huh, like, okay. it's it's completely normal. Like, the only difference is, is that there are literally magical, like, fairy tale esque creatures. Orcs, elves, fucking other bullshit wands magic dragons that kind of fucking fuckery right yes and i was thinking to myself how could you unstupid this story and one of the the best ways i thought of was just turn bright into shadow run hmm. so for those of you who don't know if, if you don't harry permit me to mansplain to you please um the the lore behind Shadowrun is somewhere in the early 2020s or whenever you can actually just change it but like very much like D&D it has its own lore that you can just ignore and just create for yourself right okay the lore in Shadowrun is is in the early 2020s or sometime along that the world just changes magic begins to exist and people change into like creatures elves giants or whatever i i haven't played Shadowrun in a long fucking time i can't remember the the different species Mm -hmm. but essentially magical creatures just people turn into magical creatures and that creates like this inequality and like there's a cyberpunk aspect because Shadowrun is set in like the 2070s or the 2080s which means that like there have now been like three generations worth of magical like beings being born brought in this world dying and so on and so forth so there's magic high technology like cyberpunk and then there's you know these magical creatures and i was thinking to myself like so forget all of the lord of the rings past tense like dark lord bullshit and just say like in the 70s or 80s people just started randomly turning into like these creatures and magic started coming about so Mm. one the world doesn't diverge thousands and thousands of years ago where you have to like create 
this huge lore with all these little mini fucking facets, which I know you're not good enough to because fucking it took Tolkien years. And Max Landis okay. came up with shit in like fucking two years. So whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also shortens the time in which you can like create a story because yes. you don't have to think about all this extra baggage and whatnot. You have a, uh, a, a, a longer amount of time to figure out how your magic system works and all this other bullshit, but it keeps the world that you want, i.e. gangland LA with cops and orc people and elves a little more plausible without destroying people's like uh, suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really would have liked is to have seen what that would have looked like. So instead of it being like, this is a 2000 year old thing, we want to explore race, da da da. Yeah. Um, you make it the exact same thing, except you just get rid of the mythological aspect. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I dig the because I have not seen Bright, um, but uh, the concept sounds cool. Um, mm -hmm. Like, what would creatures, fantasy creatures, be like in this realm? You know, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, obviously, this is all like going off topic, but like, see, like, would this world be the same or would it be more advanced, less advanced? You know, how would things be? Yeah. Like the thing is, is like, I, if you don't think about like all of the, the plot holes and like the lore breaking ideas behind the movie. Yeah. You know what? Like gangland LA with like fantasy creatures is actually kind of a cool idea. Mm -hmm. I just think the way they went about it was like really counterproductive to how they wanted to tell the story mm. because they want to do this thing where it's like, Oh, we need a wand to bring back our dark Lord. And wands are like these very powerful, like nuclear weapons, basically. Oh. So the whole idea of the story, the core of the story is kind of like a rat race around mm -hmm. LA for this wand. Right. Okay. I like the idea. I, I like, I actually like that idea. It, it interests my, my mongoloid sensibilities. I just think the way they do it contradicts so many other aspects of the story. And then they want to throw in, um, like the meditations on race and it doesn't quite, work because they're making a one-to-one -one allegory because the orcs are meant to be like oh i don't know i don't know how to explain it in a way that that would probably make sense or even would be make like a consistent logical sense from what i'm saying okay but <clears throat> i'm still of the mind that if you take the story from we have thousands of years of war to something in the kin of like district nine because district nine is like uh -huh they came here in the eighties and they've been here for like 30 years. Right. So if you apply that same kind of thing to something like bright where it's like, Oh, these people just started to turn kind of like in uh shadow run. Um, and you examine the inequality that comes from that. Mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. would be far more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can uh, see that. I, I just, I would actually really like to watch bright with you because it's like, the more I think about it, the more I just love the concept, but mm -hmm. I just hate the execution. Because I don't think anything, like, and I mean anything, in Bright works. The magic mm -hmm. system doesn't work. How they tell you stuff, but the stuff doesn't make sense works. Like, what they show you, but it doesn't reveal anything. Like, the... <sighs> It's a credit to Will Smith how good of an actor he is that he can still be good in a movie that is just so awful. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I honestly think once, uh, once all this wears down, wears out, we should totally do a, a, a live stream of us watching Bright or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm That'd down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah.
But yeah, yeah I, I don't know why I just I thought of this. Like, I watched this stupid fucking movie, and th- make no mistake, this is a campy fucking movie. Uh, uh, cast a deadly spell. Like, it takes all of like the pulpy '30s detective stuff and just and just puts in fantasy elements, and it's goofy. Okay. It's goofy as shit. Um, and I was thinking to myself, this makes no fucking sense. Like, mm-hmm. it makes sense in the inverse, where it's like, it just exists, but LA right. isn't any different. And Bright is the exact opposite, where it's like, you have, like, fantasy gangland stuff, but it's like, it wouldn't make sense because they have, like, this history that's thousands of years old, but somehow you still have as one actor jokes, the fucking Alamo, you still have Shrek, you still have Disney. Like, it's just weird. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you and I, we're going to remake it. I'll be Will Smith. It's probably going to be problematic. You'll be the York cop. It'll be great. Sounds good. Perfect. Um, So, I listened to the first Max Landis story. Yes. Death Wish, right? Death Wish. Mm-hmm. So, you've listened to it as well. Um, yes. I hope. Yes. I listened I to it. I actually enjoyed it. I'm glad. Um, <clears throat> I have like a couple eh moments, but no. I love the the psychological aspect that's kind of un- underpinning who Bruce Wayne is the alter ego yeah. um i don't enjoy necessarily how far he goes with it where it's a split personality okay hold on max landis's death wish is essentially like the origin story of batman and the concept of like superheroes and theatricality um, he starts with the death of Bruce's parents, how he becomes like this determined kid trying to control everything, um, who becomes like a ninja at like 17 or whatever, and starts to disassemble the mob in Gotham um, and begins a flood wave of reactionary uh theatricality you could put it Mm -hmm, characters mm -hmm. who are now doing outfits um theatricalities like gag weapons um and how it becomes less about the story of batman becoming batman and more the story of uh (laughs) the therapy of a psychotic man who hasn't uh hasn't quite put all of his marbles back Right. Um he gets a lot of things uh that I don't think a lot of people consider. Um when people talk about Batman, I think he's treated a little too matter of factly, if you mm. catch my understanding. Yes. Um Oh, you know, his parents died, so he was raised by you know, uh, he was raised by this butler and he he ends up working for for a league of assassins and and he has gadgets and he's got like children working for him and and he doesn't kill people and you know he's he's completely you know, he's got some dark bits but you know it's like no one i think really i think he he's a little heavy-handed with it but i think he's heavy-handed in it jesus he is heavy-handed with it in a way that i think makes sense in the logic of his story Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I can get behind that. He talks about how, upon the death of his parents, he needs to control everything. That makes sense, um, because almost the entire hour and what is it, fourteen minutes? Mm-hmm. He discusses this story. Um, almost all of it is essentially creating, uh. creating an atmosphere in which he can control Gotham. 
and not it's... through healthier or constructive ways. Mm -hmm. There are points where what he does is essentially like, oh yeah, no, he's he's kind of like the Cape Crusader. He's the guy that we kind of all collectively know. And then it becomes more obvious that one of the things that I like that his his psychosis bleeds far more deeply than just I beat up bad guys. Right. Which I think is really good. I I personally like the idea of him having, you know, like buildings or rooms or terminals secret from other people that he shares typical information with. Um meaning I like that um one the relationship he has with Dick Grayson. Mm -hmm. Uh I like that he kind of treats him like a child soldier and that upon the relationship that they develop, uh, Dick leaves and he isn't quite right after that. Yeah. And then in comes uh, Jason Todd and he's almost like this bad bandage. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like, it's it's fascinating. Uh, Landis describes a moment when Jason Todd, upon being removed from the title of Robin, essentially finds um, this second Batcave in another building and realizes that it, it, it monitors things in a completely different way because Batman isn't just stopping crimes. He is both arsonist and fire brigadier. He is both putting out the flames and starting new ones. He is. <laughs> there's this great bit where it's like they introduce this character of Bane, and you find out that Batman is actually Bane. Mm -hmm. And Jason Todd survives this encounter with quote unquote Bane. And upon realizing that Bane is Batman, Batman's like, no, Bruce Wayne did that. I had nothing to do with it. No. Um, I'm not a fan of the split personality thing. I think it removes a lot of responsibility and consequence that Bruce Wayne's character would have. I understand, like, his mind is so fucked. It works within the context of the story. But I like the idea of someone who is in control enough. I, I think it's more important that the story be about someone who is unable to let go than someone through his own choices who is unable to let go through his own choices than someone who is unable to let go through no consequence of his own. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, Jean-Paul Valley. I like, uh, I like, uh, the description of Robin beating the shit out of Jean-Paul Valley. Yeah. Just random. So fucking random. He uses, I can't tell why, but he, inf he inserts a lot of like political ideology into his stuff. Like, he describes Jason Todd as like a fucking Reagan Republican, which is weird. Yeah. Or a libertarian. I can't remember. I don't know what it is. I can't. I, I haven't. I actually would like to listen to to his to this death wish like one or two more times mm -hmm. because I would like to to get a better understanding as like why he says these things. Like, is his ideology like meant to or? is the point of death wish to satirize these ideologies because some of it seems like it is, but I, I didn't quite examine it through that lens enough. Um, I actually would have liked if he used more uncommon villains, um, like the, the polka dot man or the calendar killer or, uh, you know, characters like these, because he talks about the first main bad guy, uh, Harvey Dent. Mm -hmm. And I actually like that the theatricality bit starts with him, but I would have liked if, because it's like, you know, you, you don't, you don't go to see a Batman show or movie or anything for Polka Dot Man or fucking the calendar murder or the calendar killer uh, or calendar man. I'm sorry. Mm hmm you go for a character like Two-Face. You go for a character like Penguin or Joker or Bane. Um, I like that Two-Face is kind of like the the popular face, 
but I really would have liked the idea of these smaller guys coming in and doing this. Max Landis has like a habit of like wanting to put in the big names first and put in the big names like up front. And I'm not the biggest fan of that. He talks about wanting to do like a linear story. Essentially, these characters will live and die and this story will, you know, will have a beginning, middle and end and a, you know, a conclusion at some point, which I like. Um, it's enjoyable to see or at least imagine an instance where this story has a finite uh, amount of information, a, a finite amount of content, right? Mm -hmm. There's a point to it. There's a, there's a definite ending, a story that, that, um, that is going to be told and finished. Um, so with that logic, it would be nicer to imagine the beginning of this introduces some of these quirkier low level characters that don't mean much harm. And then you have the crazy ones. Cause he talks about mm -hmm. Edward Nigma. And one of the things I like is that Ed <laughs> Edward Nigma's background is that he's the guy who kind of like fucks over the wall street establishment. Yeah. And when Batman comes about, none of, none of these average people who already exist that's the the key thing these people already exist but it's only until batman and two-face come along that uh that these people really start to delve into the theatricality yeah. edward nigma again is just a guy fucking over the system with his massive big dick intellect but after batman comes along now he's the riddler Cobblepot, uh, a, a prominent, you know, fraudulent uh, billionaire crime lord, was just Cobblepot until he had a run-in with the the Batman, and now he's the <laughs> the gimmick-toting penguin. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. I really like that. Like, I almost enjoy the fact that people that he actually looks at Batman and says, "There's no way that." Batman is not the one who is creating these crazy individuals. Right. Like I, I, I really do like that. The, I know I, I do feel that he does go a bit overboard with the split personality thing. And I mentioned that before, but there's something that I've just been needing to, to see. And it's the fact that this guy isn't the hero, mm -hmm. you know, by the time he's in the justice league and most of these stories, he's just like, the quiet skeptical billionaire but like i really like the idea of this guy who's who's not all there in some respects like there are moments of beauty there are moments of brilliance there's moments of heartfelt levity but he's not quite there and he's not willing to be all there yeah and that's I what i like um i really would have liked to have seen more on the the lois lane investigating him bit but I still got a lot of good stuff on it. I'm not sure how I feel about him tricking Lex Luthor into forming the Justice League. I feel it's a little bit too top-notch for me at the moment, just because I want to know more about the whole Batman stuff. I want to know a little bit more about these characters more on an individual level than like uh, a Justice League MCU thing, where it's like, oh, yeah. we have files on, on Ghidorah. And, you know, we have a montage of all the, the cave paintings of Ghidorah, Mothra, and, and Garrus, and all that. But yeah. but still cool. Yeah, I, I recommend... Uh, have you started another one of his videos or no? I will start it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, definitely watch uh, a, uh, Agent of Batman. Agent of Batman, okay. Yeah, that one's a more higher quality video. It's not just him sitting in front of the computer. Um, but... Yeah, uh, basically, he explains the story. I forget what he starts explaining, but he talks about the stuff that he, that um, uh, Superman starts going through once once he's being trained by Batman. Okay. Yeah, so you kind of get a different idea, a different view of Batman as well from there, especially from uh, Superman's side. Okay, when I. <sighs> I, okay, I get you. I get you. Mm. When I think of um, when I think of some of the inspirations that crop up for me, mm -hmm. um, I definitely think of Kingdom Come. 
Kingdom Come. Hmm. Kingdom Come is a is a comic book thread. Uh, essentially, a couple years in the future of the Justice League. Batman is retired, okay. but he's like he's crippled, hmm. and he uses automatons or robots to police Gotham. Hmm. And he's like this recluse, and it's like ah. I wish I, I I I had read this all the way through. I I didn't give okay. it the chance it deserved. I would love to go back again, but I do remember like this really great image of Batman in like this, or Bruce Wayne, this old tired man in this like weird, help me walk kind of metal outfit, getting dressed down by a uh, by this older silver haired Superman about like justice and law and like him taking people's freedom and all that and it it when i was hearing him talk about control and mm -hmm. trying to reclaim the control that he'd never had <clears throat> and his grip over gotham i definitely thought of of kingdom come like i mm -hmm. definitely got that vibe um i also liked um the blue beetle i yes. enjoy that he's essentially everything that batman isn't the blue beetle is this character that has the adoration of the, both the people and the police force whereas batman is just this terrifying image and in his universe he's even more terrifying yes um again like i don't care much for I I mentioned it before. I'm sure you're bored of it already, but I don't care much for the uh, Two Face had a had a psychological break in college that Bruce like mm -hmm. covered up. I didn't I didn't care for that. I I don't know what it was. I've never been of the mind that uh, that that's been a particularly interesting avenue for uh, for Harvey Dent. Now say what you will. Mine the my whole alcoholic dirty attorney wanting to do right at the end like sure whatever it's poorly thought out and it's poorly considered but sometimes going with the most straightforward approach for for a character isn't always the worst i mean a character yeah. who's literally just made insane just because of the the lengths that he went to to do what he did and then is is ruined for it is is another thing altogether that works you don't need any any uh preconceived mechanisms to make him insane yeah but like it, it's still fine i i just i just think like of all the things sometimes it can be a bit much he has this tendency i think to to exaggerate uh psychological behavior i think i i am in no way a uh a, a, a psychologist i have barely any understanding of the human mind but i feel like in my opinion the way he uses uh insanity almost takes away from the consequences of these characters actions okay yeah that makes sense but that being said, it's still interesting. I like the take that he has. I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't disagree with it. Um, I really want to see where they go with this like psychotic Batman. Yeah, I really. I'm interested just because it's like I. Uh, that's the thing. Is like even if I disagree on one or two levels, I like that he hits the arguments that like that everyone like I said just kind of takes for granted. Like oh. This guy kind of like trained this kid to be a child soldier. Yep. And then like, <laughs> and then literally just took another kid and just copied and pasted the exact same thing onto this guy, except like still has the same emotional baggage with this character. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I think yeah. I want to hear more about um, Gordon. Uh, Barbara Gordon. I want to hear more about some of these side characters, to be honest, because mm -hmm. like I was saying before, a ground up mentality is really interesting. I want to get to know these 
characters or these side or periphery characters before they become, you know, the icons that, you know, everyone knows them as before he becomes the, the mustache with the glasses. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, um, I, I enjoy your view of, uh, of his story. Um, like the whole slip past personality thing. Um, cause that's like a heavy, point of you know batman in uh his world so uh i think i don't know i can see it happening um i can see it as in again being trying trying to be too much in control that he feels like he needs to create like for example bane or uh uh the other person you know, create all these other characters and who he wants to be and who he is. Like, uh, was it the Cape Crusader? Like, that's who he wants to be, right? Um, yeah, this image and... of who he thinks he is. Like, yes, I like that. I've always enjoyed that because in the cartoons, in the shows, he is the Cape Crusader. There's no yes. like, his perception is his reality, and our perception mm -hmm. is that reality. Yes, but he. I like that. I like that. He has a perception that is not the reality. Mm -hmm. He wants to be this person. He he clouds this this desire yeah. to to uh, to control in this desire mm -hmm. to be like the savior of Gotham. Yeah, and I think it kind of hits. Uh, I think to a lot of people, where just us, you know, there's certain things that we believe we're doing, or or you know what I mean. Like uh, we have this idea of like this is. Like, oh, we're doing right or whatever. Like, it's that whole thing, right? People are doing things that they believe is right or correct, but in reality, it may not be, right? Or for other people, it may not be. Mm -hmm. So I think it really hits, you know, that point of view when it comes to just us as humans, you know? Um, I think that was cool because, uh, yeah, like, like, yeah, the split personality. I think it was a great um, story-wise. I think it was... Uh, a good obviously you know it's a good um way to explain um certain things right like again bane um him becoming bane and causing mayhem like you said uh he's the arson and the fire you know the firefighter so it's like but he doesn't know it you know he, he doesn't know that he's creating the fires that he's putting out um because he's so caught up in what he like you know like i think maybe you know, in his head, he believed like when B his this personality of Bane was created, maybe he like created it because he wanted in on, um, you know, finding more, you know, villains or whatever. Right. People he was trying to take down. So he created he got so in depth with that character that he became Bane. And you know what I mean? So I think it just kind of makes sense because he's that being who like not being batman but like being in control like has become his world that he just yeah. got so far into this character of bane of max malone of uh, the cape crusader of bruce wayne you know like he's like when he's in character he's in character because he needs to be in character yeah. to maintain control of gotham but obviously that's the fault right like yeah, I, I, I'm more sympathetic to how you explain it. Mm -hmm. I think he, Max Landis does a really, I think a, a really poor job, at, actually setting up context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he does a really good job at setting up a narrative when he discusses yes. like, you know, oh, this happened and this happened and this is happening. Mm -hmm. But when you describe it, I think it it has a a. A, m a little more weight to it yeah at least in my opinion okay yeah because i mean when you describe like his psychosis is pushing him into being this character and he is so attached to saving gotham that he will literally like <laughs> turn right. into someone else to destroy a portion of it so that he has an excuse to keep going like that makes more sense to me mm -hmm. and, and you describe that i think it's he he has this 
I and I, I I don't mean to speak ill. I'm just saying, I think he has a habit of. Oh God, how do I even explain? He has this habit of overstating something in the most unnecessary way possible. Uh, yes. Um. But yeah. I mean, that's kind of how I. Again, I. This is Max's you know, Batman, and that's how I took it, and I was like, oh, that make to me, like, it, it makes sense, you know, um, you know, he's, like, his heart is in the right place, it's just, he's not yeah, his doing brain it, isn't. yeah, his brain isn't, um, and then, uh, it's, yeah, like, I want to bring stuff up with the later, the other videos that he has, and, um, but you should just watch them, uh, it, it's good, um, I'll, I'll try watching a couple more, and we can definitely bring those up too, because I'd like to bring up a couple more to discuss. Yeah, and especially if you like the the the, the Blue Beetle. I don't know if you've watched the video of him talking about him, but that one's really good too. Once he goes in depth and really ex like explains the Blue Beetle and what is the Blue Beetle and why Bruce Wayne is like really like not wanting or not, you know not liking the Blue Beetle. Um, yeah, but like I. I like that there's a moment where he discusses um you know the 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 boy the this young 18 year old who who has this stuff commissioned and they they don't think twice of it because you know it's like he's this disturbed boy and then the guy who designs it is all fired mm -hmm. and they're like oh well we'll we'll discuss him later and then you find out that like the guy that Bruce fired is the guy who's supplying the Blue Beetle with his tech and armament. And mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm digging, I'm waiting for his next video. Uh, um, I, I know he said that he's, it's going to be a higher quality, kind of like what um, uh, Agent of Batman's going to be. It's going to be, uh, it's not just going to be him sitting in front of a computer. It's gonna be an actual video explaining everything. Oh, wow. um, okay. Yeah, so it's it's taking a little longer to come out, but he's 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 I think he's editing right now. I think he's recorded everything. He's just in editing mode, and once it's gonna be out, he'll he'll release it and stuff like that. So I'm okay, excited. Good. I forgot what exactly the the story's gonna be, but um, I know it's like um I forget. I don't remember. I'm not even gonna try to guess what <laughs> what it is. Wonder Woman, but all of her psychotic bullshit. Um, that has already come out. God damn it, Harry. Sorry. Uh, that one's I think one of the most recent ones. Uh, he explains. Um, uh, Wonder Woman. I love the Wonder Woman story. Uh, it's great. Um, that's one of like one that I really like too. Uh, I'm sure you'd like it too. Um. Okay. He actually brings in John Constantine. No, actually, he mentioned John Constantine discovering um, the mascara. Yep. Yeah, I, I thought that was actually really interesting. Yeah. He, I'm still of the mind that, like, that verges on a bit like, okay, I get it. But I think he does that so little, and he goes straight back to the story that I... I it's a it's something that I I'm able to look past. Yeah, so when he goes more into the Wonder Woman storyline, you'll he'll explain more of what John Constantine is, you know, it's all about. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm so he, too, I'm also interested in seeing what he does with Lex Luthor because he described Lex Luthor yeah. in pretty much the same way that I think he he always has been, like this egomaniac. And I've always I've always liked that. Yeah, I've always liked that about Lex Luthor. I mean, I have probably unfairly labeled him as like Bruce Wayne, but evil. <laughs> but yeah. I think this um this this version of Lex Luthor and this version of uh, of Bruce Wayne are definitely far more apart. Yeah, in an interesting way, and I'm interested in seeing what they do with him. Yeah, I, I don't remember. Um, I again, I don't know. Like, I don't read a lot of comics, so 
Lex Luthor, from what I know, damn, I don't really remember even from the Superman movies how Lex Luthor was. Um, this is like the first time I've actually like got like how Lex Luthor is as a character. Mm-hmm. So this is like the only thing I have in mind uh, of how Lex Luthor is as a character. It so, seems pretty good. I'm, I'm yeah, actually like really it. seeing what they do with it. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't know how I feel about the tricked into doing this or that. I mean, it would make sense, but I don't know. I that part I, I'm not sure about, but I am interested in seeing what they do with him. Mm-hmm. I'm sure down the road he's gonna put a uh, Lex Luthor only video and kind of explain more about all that stuff. I know yeah. he explains certain things in um uh, in one of his videos. I don't remember which one. Um, but in one of the videos, he goes into more detail about uh, basically Lex Luthor's, like, upbringing. Okay. Um, and kind of, like, how his mind kind of, or not his mind, but how he kind of, like, came about of okay. being the person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, I just don't remember which one. But I definitely do recommend uh, Agent Batman to be next. And if you want to see the Wonder Woman uh, video after that, you definitely can. Um, yeah, okay. that one's really good. I'll definitely have something to talk about the next podcast with this. Fuck yeah. Um, yeah. Anything? Any uh, last words about uh, that Kryptonian epic? Fuck Jason Todd. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um. So we recently. At least for me, for the first time, I've played State of Decay. Yeah, a stake of D-Day. <laughs> um, I liked it. It was fun. Um, running around and killing zombies is always fun. Uh, Who doesn't the, love killing zombies? The opening of the door, as you're explaining, while driving around is uh, more satisfying than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hold on. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, <laughs> State of Decay, I don't care about the story, is an open world, like, resource management base building survival zombie game. Uh, you get a character, they have a stat, they could, uh, they could build their stats up a bit, and, uh, that's pretty much it. You just, build shit and you survive and you you go out into like this midwestern town and uh kill shit i don't give a shit about the story um the fun stuff is playing with your friends uh it's got a slightly cartoony and outlandish mechanics system not mechanic system that didn't sound right um game design system i guess sounds fine um you can do funny shit like <laughs> you can drive and hold your door open and just whack zombies that way, which is fun. Uh, last week or early this week, uh, Harry, another friend of ours, and myself played. Needless to say, Harry got us all fucking killed a couple times or a million um, times. Yes. Uh, um, but it is it is enjoyable. Uh, we kind of dicked around. I'm sure we didn't get the full experience, but um. It's always kind of fun when uh, when you're playing a game and you get the chance to do it with your friends and there's always <laughs> the Joker. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, the semi-serious one and then, like, the actual serious one. And that's kind of how our setup is at the moment. Um, we actually might try another game next week. Uh, mm-hmm. But we're not sure yet. We do like the whole zombie thing. Um, that is yeah. how, depending on how bored we get of it. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, bear? We're digging... Yeah. Oh, bear? I muted myself by accident. Well, look at that. What the hell, bear? Sorry. <laughs> um, I was to say, uh, yeah, uh, I'm digging State of Decay as well. Um, uh, but we can definitely see what else. We can go back to Dauntless. We can try a different game. Uh, so we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, 
but uh yeah i um i was i was the jokester and uh, as for usual you are the jokester not were you are i i are yeah i are the jokester yeah. um loss of words there you little fucker <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I enjoyed it. The Harry, resource no, stuff was kidding. kind of... Don't leave. Oh, Harry. God. Why? Harry, why'd you move me? Sorry. No, I just... The fucking muting. What button am I pressing? Guys, guys, take him away. Hold on. Hold on. I gotta... I'm gonna try this again. I'm gonna find out what button is... Okay, that isn't it. That isn't it. Nope. 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 Okay, I'm. How is that it? Is that it? that one? That one? Okay, so how the hell did I mute myself? I pressed every single button that I just pressed. Little did Harry know, I could mute him in real life. Son of a bitch. <laughs> um, yeah, I enjoyed the game. Uh, the resource part was a little hard for me to handle just because, um, I don't know. It's weird. I play. Yeah, one of the silly things that they do is there's like committed resources to each person playing. Huh. So like one region will have a couple boxes for me or for Harry or for our other player friend and it won't be like we all have access to the resources, which is weird. And then on top of yeah. that since they would have to come or we would all have to go to a certain player's server. There's no hub server that we could all just share together. Um, base management is typically relegated to one person instead yeah. of a shared instance. And I think that's a little difficult. I'm not sure if that is on our end or if that's on the game designers end, because the game designers obviously did that on purpose to us. Three just well-known idiots um no uh it does feel a little weird it feels a little restrictive doesn't it yeah like okay so like i how do you say it is restrictive because you have to kind of like because the thing is we're trying to figure out if it's uh character wise or it's by person because you're able to switch characters which i was kind of confused about um and then you also like you can only have certain things and it it was like it's like way more complicated than we thought it was going to be um which is fine i mean i'm sure once you get it down is it's fine like again i was about to say uh I come from a role, you know, RPG uh, background. So I play complicated games, you know, where you got to know stats and leveling up and what you need to do next and this and that, blah, blah, blah. You got to be more patient. You got to like kind of do your research and figure things out and stuff like that. So I come from that kind of background, um, but I was still kind of impatient, I guess, just because I don't know, it's, it's different when I'm running around with friends than like, uh, I'm sitting down by myself because you know I grew up playing RPGs all the time, and I'm usually playing by myself, so it's a different environment, I guess. And mm -hmm. so trying to figure out how this game plays out with like only I can open up and go through this uh this like box is kind of like okay, so why is that? And we had we would have to figure it out. Um, we didn't know that uh like each uh like each of us had four characters to go through um and each of them had different equipment Stat. on them stats and then equipment um i don't know it, i'm going to go on a little rant uh, oh, uh about uh it's it's my turn to talk right so <sighs> so Yvette and i were talking about it um, it evades the, the friend that we're playing with. Um, but we're talking about the, uh, um, uh, we're looking through games and we noticed that there are like the category RPG has a lot of games that are thrown into it that aren't 
so to say, RPGs, like true RPGs. Um, And it seems like every single game that you can think of has a what we call RPG element, right? Either it's leveling up or or raising a skill, gaining skills, like like and I explained I don't know if I explained it here before, but I I've explained it plenty of times where like the whole reason I got into Call of Duty was because Call of Duty 4 had a leveling up system and when you level up you have access to a new gun, right? And if you have an axe, and then that gun, the more you use it, the more things you unlock, right? And I was like, oh, that's great. Like, this is, like, this is an RPG element that I love, right? So I, that's how I got into Call of Duty. Um, and I don't mind it, but it seems like there are so many games out there that just have it, right? And, yep. and it, the progression system. Yeah, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it's like, it's everywhere and it, and, and yeah, what we we're talking about was like the multiplayer progression and marketplace is what they implement for last ability. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, I'm right now currently I'm playing, um, what is it called? Um, dark siders. Um, it's a, you know, hack and slash game, kind of like God of War, Dante's Inferno. Um, it's fun, but it you know you have to like level up your weapon, and you have to unlock this, and you have to you know collect souls, and then you have to trade souls in for items. It's like I don't know, like I get it. You know, it's a cool game. I'm enjoying it so far. Um, but I just I just right now just started thinking like I I'm trying to f- think of a game. That has like zero, and I mean zero RPG elements that's like come out in the maybe like past decade. Like the only game that I can think of right at the top of my head has been uh, Left 4 Dead. Fair enough. Like there is no leveling up system in that. It's literally pure arcade. Would you consider uh, Call of Duty like to have? RPG elements because oh, hundred percent. Consider the the weapon progression system. Man, well, if there's yeah, because okay, so let's you know think. You're right because if we're talking purely from a mechanic standpoint, mm-hmm. uh, the the experience progression system is uh an RPG element mm-hmm. in itself. Like yes, like. That is the only thing in Call of Duty that I would consider, like, that kind of element. And that's used all the time. Yep. And and that's something that obviously goes into, like, we were talking about, just keeping the player playing, right? And it's funny, um, we were talking about um, Fallout and Skyrim. Like, would we, like, we would not call those pure RPGs because they're not. They have a lot like heavy RPG elements like gaining skills and leveling up and all that. But they are not true RPGs because true RPGs are really turn based, right? Um, Where, you know, Fallout and Skyrim aren't. They're first person um, games. They're Fallout's a first person shooter, you know. That's is 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 Knights of the Old Republic a true rpg because it still does the turn-based aspect of it just in real time um i haven't played knights of the old republic but um yeah i I can't really say if it is or not i just like obviously like D &D is like the original rpg right so like just think of like that and how far away like that is like for example for example for example Japanese RPGs, um, J- JRPG, um, like the original Final Fantasies, or the original, uh, the Final Fantasies, you know, um, and all that. Like, there's plenty of more, but like, those are like also, for the most part, true RPGs because that, everything's turn based. But if we're going, uh, I don't know if I agree because. 
I would say that because here's I don't know because I'm probably looking at it from a story perspective because mm-hmm. the story of Final Fantasy is super railroady, like an RPG. I think in its truest sense gives player freedom and the story is crafted around what they do and not the story that that the developers want to tell true like but... if you want to go based off of like off of game mechanics like i i would probably agree with you again i haven't played mm-hmm. final fantasy that's not my avenue of of like of uh of play yeah uh, like when it comes I... to f- I'll say when it, when it comes to video game freedom, as in like, you know, the way D&D is like, there is no game out there that can compete that with that. that. No, yeah. nowhere near. So when it comes to like, as I say, like, it, you know, it's called JRPGs because like, that's literally like the closest, like, I'm sure there's uh non-Japanese games out there that are basically the same thing, but it's like, you know, it that's like the the staple you know right like J- jrpgs are like the staple of like what a video game rpg looks like um uh what was it i think the we're discussing the original fallouts i think those i haven't played them but they seem like more closer to what uh, an rpg would be right be. yeah but does that does that invalu- okay so hold on i think it's safe to say that Fallout New Vegas is one of your favorite games. Um, that... it's definitely my favorite Fallout. Okay. Oh, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. So, does that invalidate Fallout New Vegas, where it's like player freedom is probably at an all-time high mm-hmm. in almost all of the Fallout games, like in every sense of the word. Uh, like the perk system. Uh how you choose to play the benefits of each and every way you play how the story works around your choices Mm -hmm. like they give you i i I know see this is this is the difficult part for me because i think Mm -hmm. you and i are kind of hitting like an apples and oranges thing yeah because i'm coming at rpgs mainly from like narrative okay and i you're coming at it from gameplay and game design and that Mm. i think you're more correct in that sense but i think narrative has a greater not greater i think narrative in terms of game narrative and in in Mm. terms of game story has a significant uh say in what becomes an rpg because it like i don't just consider a turn-based rpg truly an rpg like if that would be the case, like Fallout 1 and 2, Final Fantasy, they would be like exactly RPGs. But I don't think Fallout New Vegas is exempt from being a true RPG just because it's an action RPG or because... Mm. Uh, see, that? I, see, that's weird to me because it's like, I don't disagree with you. I don't... I don't... I don't disagree with you that... Um, that Final Fantasy isn't an RPG, but I consider an RPG something that deals with player freedom. And that extends yeah. to something like how they choose to play the game mm. and how the story is wrapped around it. Because if it's a story where they're, the developers are telling you something, like, you are this person, these are the people that you have to care about, and this is always going to be the outcome of what you do, mm-hmm. then I don't consider that, like necessarily the mark of a good role playing game. Yeah. But like if you're playing a game where you have all these choices and it's just a shooter then maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, because I mean I think, I think something like um I don't necessarily think that um what am I saying? Um is is um is dishonored i know i use it a lot but is dishonored a role-playing game because the choices you make do have outcomes but they're not the game isn't built around your choices mm-hmm. you you can choose a couple things you can there there are a couple of arbitrary choices that you can make in the game that don't really do all that much but the core role-playing aspect that i like is how you choose to either you can choose to be 
stealthy or violent or how you use your powers. But I don't no. consider Dishonored a role playing game. But I consider it. Uh, I consider that it has role playing elements because of your choice of gameplay and mm. the, the fact that the developers allow you to have that choice. Yeah. I can, I can see it from your standpoint. The narrative standpoint's fine. Like, I look at it when it comes to, like, player freedom, like Grand Theft Auto V Online, uh, Warzone can have some stuff. Like, there is when it comes to that, but I don't think... Yeah, I guess in my would, mind... Go would, ahead. Would GTA V be a role-playing game? Like, you were... You are playing, like, Tommy Vassetti, you're playing CJ, you're playing Trevor, Michael, Franklin, but, mm -hmm. like, you can control what kind of person they are, but that illusion is kind of shattered when you have to see their 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 cutscenes and the things that they do without yeah. your control. But it's like, is that a role playing game? Yeah. Is it a, like it's immersive? Yeah. I and... think personally, like for example, Grand Theft Auto, like when it comes to being like a sandboxy where you can kind of go wherever you want, do whatever you want, like that's a rpg element that they were never going for like yeah because the thing is like true like dungeons and dragons rpg like like no one looks at that for reference when it comes to um what you know they're making their game out of right uh you know the rockstar didn't look at dungeons and dragons for like all right what kind of story can we develop out of this or what can we get from dungeons and dragons i think because the, the thing is storytelling is not just an rpg thing storytelling is just a human thing like storytelling has been a thing that's been you know for a long time and when it comes to anything people would love to do whatever they want so yeah. i don't think personally again this is myself i don't i don't think narrative or storytelling uh doing whatever you want is strictly RPG, right? Okay, yeah. To myself, um, because it's like again, our like role playing game is like again, it's a like it's a game. So like, there's mechanics, right? So that's why I'm always looking at like you're right. I am looking at it mechanically wise. I'm not looking at it as narrative wise. Yeah, and another thing is like another example of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Jack and Daxter, Jack 2 and Jack 3. Jack 2 and Jack 3, you're in an open environment. You can go anywhere you want in these environments. Mm -hmm. But you have no, like, you ha there, there's no player choice in how you play the game. Mm -hmm. you're, given, you're given great platforming and traversal mechanics, but, like, that's it. There's yep. no... Uh, I guess it's important to figure out how you would define an RPG. Yeah, yeah, like what that would make the most sense. Yeah, because it's just because the thing is like any game really has again RPG elements. Like yeah. again, the leveling up and all that stuff and, and the narrative stuff, like doing whatever you want, like it's just hard because it's like again, storytelling has been a thing that humans have been doing for fucking millennia, right? So it's like mm -hmm. I can't say that that's an RPG element because, you know, it's been done in books and movies and, you know, radio shows, whatever. Right. It's like, you know, it's not strictly an RPG thing where like RPG, um, the mechanics behind it, right. Playing like, uh, stats and leveling up and all that. Like that's kind of, I'm not, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure if, the, you know, that's where it first started, but you know, that's to me where I think is the first part where, the leveling up system came about. Um, and then that's, you know, it didn't really go into video games uh, right away. Right. Like the first games didn't have a leveling up system. Um, uh, obviously because they're, you know, the first games or whatever, but you know, um, so it's like, the, to me, when it comes to RPG elements, it's, it's strictly mechanically, but you're not wrong at looking at it at how, the player choice because you're right japanese rpg games don't really have a lot of options it's basically are you like here's the story you're going to follow it but depending on you know like your level and what weapons you have it's gonna let you get through quicker or you're gonna have some trouble getting through the story mm -hmm. yeah yeah but yeah. No, I, I, I like how you've been describing that so far. I don't I don't disagree with most of that. 
Yeah, and then going for the you know the original topic, like I, I'm not upset about it, but it's in everything, and there's just times where I just want to play a game to play a game, like for Warzone, for example. There, you know, there's all these guns, and I would love, you know, I've ranted to you and everyone else about it, where like I I hate the fact that in Warzone the base gun that you get is awful you need to level it up and get the specific attachments for it for you to be able to use it correctly because if you have the base gun compared to a person who has it maxed out and has the the right you know because the thing is current call of duty like the original call of duty 4 right the first call of duty that had you level up and and earn uh, attachments for your guns you only were able to have one attachment mm-hmm. or sorry two with the perk bling but one attachment for the most part right and that was that wasn't like some detrimental thing where like oh my god my opponent had a red dot so that's why i lost like no yeah red you know what i mean like there wasn't anything like in in the game that like broke you know like okay like you have to level up the gun to get this or else it's you know like you're gonna die every time like no no you can completely annihilate everyone with a base gun you know where like in current call of duties especially warzone you could put up to five attachments that make your gun amazing right and if you're running the base gun with like you know the smallest magazine possible and it has a stupid amount of recoil and you could barely move around with it and then someone who has like a 60 you know like a, like the largest mag like 60 to 80 to 100 rounds in one fucking magazine and then they have like a sight they can shoot you from like fucking 200 meters away and they can fucking you know the bullet velocity and all this other shit you know and silencers and it's like it it bothers me like that's the stuff that bothers me when it comes to like rpg elements that's like it you have to grind so much to be able to compete with anybody and that's yeah. and like if i want to grind i'm hey i'm down to grind i've grinded in a lot of games to get what i wanted and i'm down for it and again i grew up playing rpgs i know what grind is but when it comes to certain games grinding shouldn't be a thing it sh- it, that's why i miss the left for dead days where we could just pop in a game and play you know yeah. now everything i can't think of one thing everything has some form of rpg element where you have to grind level up you know or whatever to get what you want or get what you need sorry yeah not want get what you need because there's there's just you have to get it or else you're not going to be able to play the game like you there you go you'll be able to play but you're not going to have a good time you know like the whole buying system like free to play like okay well if you want you know to compete you can pay money to compete it's like that's fine whatever you know i get the free to play uh you know concept right if you don't have the time to grind to get it for free you probably have the money because you're working right so just cough over a couple you know like 20 bucks or something you get whatever you want that's that's fine with me I, I'm, I'm okay if you if you love the game you know if you like the game you'll be willing to spend 20 dollars to get what you want right or what you need yeah i i do think you're you're hitting a point about like video game marketplaces mm-hmm. where it's it's less about creating a game. It's less about creating a a a role playing game, right? And more yeah. about taking the progression system and using it to like to milk grinding into something yeah. that creates replayability instead of just creating a game on its own merits with replayability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just. I, I don't know. I, I guess it's just kind of like caught me. Like we're for a long time, I just have never been able to find that game that I could just play, 
right? Where I can like, I'm okay with spending some money to get what I want, you know, whatever, but I haven't been able to find that game. And I think it's just because it's that concept of what video games are now, right? Like, yeah, it's like you have to grind for things that you, that you need. And, you know, sometimes I don't have that time, right? I have a work a full-time job and I have other shit to do and I don't have that time. But at the same time, it just seems like they're asking for so much. So many things are coming out and I get it. There's people who are constantly playing the game and want new things and whatever. I get it. But it's just like, I feel like it's too much, you know, and a lot of, and I, I, I hear complaints from a lot of people. A lot of people leave games to go to other games because they're just tired of, you know, the constant grinding. They want something different. And it's funny because they go to other games that, are the exact same thing but because they're brand new to it they don't see it they just like oh yeah i love this game you know i'm getting this and that blah blah, blah. and like putting money into it and they're having a good time but it's like you're doing the exact same thing just a different fucking video game like every video game has this thing like you know like i'm referencing warzone because that's the game that we play a lot and it's the game that i've been recently playing and it's like the same thing they're coming out with new guns and every season that comes out there's a new fucking battle you know battles whatever battle pass you know it's like and you have to like play hella hours to get what you want and you know like oh this is only available at the fucking battle pass if you don't get it here you won't get it until like you know who knows when right and it's just i don't know it bothers me you know i I get you like I only harp because I do think they're absolutely good in this way. Mm -hmm. But I play, like, every year I play Prey Moon Crash. Play Moon Mm -hmm. Crash is probably 20 hours tops, if Mm -hmm. you're good. Maybe less. But the thing is, is that they use roguelike elements to procedurally, like, randomize the map. Okay. And that's the kind of replayability that I like. There's every every bit of added content to it is free. There's no hidden, you need to pay for this to get the full enjoyment. You literally are playing five characters. Your goal is to get all of them out without dying. And that is it. Mm-hmm. And over the span of the game, the maps change depending on who you're playing. Okay. And I love this. I love this method. And it, this works. For, this isn't just Prey. I, I, I don't play enough indie games. I really don't. But there are indie games that utilize the roguelike elements. And I think that is a far more healthy mm-hmm. um, mechanic that should be enabled, that should be validated. Yeah. Instead of, you know just mindlessly grinding for something that's just going to get reset the next day because one they're they're both arbitrary like you don't win anything substantial to play in the actual prey game Mm -hmm. it's just you play it because it's good because it creates a memorable experience like i like playing call of duty with you i I really do right Um, but the experience comes from playing with other people if yeah. If I have to like play it on my own, grind for three months, knowing that it's all going to get thrown away, yeah, and I have to do it again just because they're trying to keep me that way, that's kind of infuriating. Yep. So. No, I, I 100% agree. Um... And, and that is the, that I think both of those instances use role playing elements except one of them i think does it in a in a non toxic way one of them isn't you know you're not level this you're not level that you you find resources you get abilities that changes how you play and you get to mm-hmm. work your preference and like i was saying in terms of mechanics working on your preference how you choose to play you can do the same thing with call of duty mm mm-hmm except it's just meant to keep you there in a, in a different, like less engaging way, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I second that. Um, yeah, I mean, 
yeah, it was just something that ran through my head right now that I was just thinking about that. It just, it just started irking me, you know? I was like, dude, this is fucking bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love if, it's funny, because I talk about like, oh, online, and yeah. then now online seems like it's a slippery slope, but I would love to play an online style game with you that is literally just online. I don't mean like, mm. sure, they have a story mode, yada, yada. I don't mean like, I don't need a marketplace. I don't need a shop. I don't need anything. All I want is is an experience mm-hmm. that I can share with my friends that doesn't have to be monetized or built to, to uh, artificially create scarcity. What I mean by that is like how we were talking about the seasons. It's just creating a fake sense of urgency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's it. And it's, 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 it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely awful. And I felt, you know what? I'll, I'll take one for the team. I love Sea of Thieves. I think Sea of Thieves yeah. is a fun fucking game that does that. But they're, they've recently introduced things like Seasons. And I'm not even going to defend them. Before Seasons came about, they were still doing stuff like that. Mm. Your exclusivity was based on, you know, playing for this amount of time. And the only time I really genuinely enjoyed something close to exclusivity is when it's, you know, well, you've put in the time to play this and you've been here for a long time. That's yeah. the only time I genuinely like it. And even then, I don't care for it all that much. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, we can definitely go out and look for a fucking uh, an online game like that. Oh, I know. Let's, we should get Fallout 76. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they actually just... In- <laughs> you fucker. <laughs> uh, you know what's so... So, I think I went on a little bit of a journey. Not a journey. I don't learn anything. I'm an idiot. Um, when Fallout 76 was announced, you were interested in it. And I thought the idea of doing like an always online, like multiplayer Fallout was kind of interesting. And I, I would have liked yeah. to have done that with you. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I played a bit of Fallout New Vegas mm-hmm. and I realized what I was missing. And I've been wanting to play Fallout and Fallout 2. Yes. I just, I feel like Fallout New Vegas is just, well, I mean, it is, but it's like, it it just, it feels so plainly like uh, what we were Mm -hmm. talking about with Sea of Thieves and Call of Duty. Yeah. It's just an attempt to monetize people's uh, experience with Fallout. Like, sure, yeah. I mean, if they produce a good, experience it's still a good experience but it's still also more than likely a a way of of prolonging people's desire to play this game using monetary uh, incentives and creating the scarcity that we were talking about yeah yeah i mean i think you're definitely uh on there when it comes to that um but like we discussed before, it's just, and it's just hitting me now, but this is just how video game companies do their thing, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's just how they do it, um, you know, and, and, and it's working. It's fucking working. Like I've grinded in, you know, for a few seasons in Call of Duty, cause I was like, man, I need to get every single level in the battle pass before it fucking resets. And I did it with Destiny too, as well. You know, I, I was like, oh, I got to Try to finish the fucking battle. Destiny is fun. Like it is. What, what's great is like the idea that that everyone can have this different armor from what they're doing, but it's still mm-hmm. like the idea was to be able to show people that they have stories to tell from the 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 cool fucking deeds that they did. Yeah. Right. And that's such a cool instance, but it's like it's still within that we need 
people to keep playing for years and years and years and possibly spend money and and all of that. And it's just not I don't know, it's tiresome. It's not appealing. Yeah. Like if you're doing it to stream, if you want to do like a niche thing, sure or whatever, but like I don't know. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean <sighs> I just I don't know what else to fucking say. <laughs> it's just like I think we kind of like, are like, kind of set our points when it comes to this stuff. And it was a a random tangent as well. It was um, a nice one. It was yeah, it was fair. a nice one too. Yeah, it was a it was random. It was spur of the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, that's I think it's my two cents about all that stuff. Uh, and I think we're out of topics. <laughs> I've ever heard from you. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, I'm. I think the only RPG at this point I'm going to be playing is Final Fantasy VII, the original. And mm-hmm. until someone really, really, really like, like convinces me to play something else, uh, like. E- <laughs> It's not, again, I think the, when Call of Duty was in its prime, right? Call of Duty 4, 1 over 2, Black Ops. Um, I think those were the last games that I played that were sh- truly, like, that felt, um, like, arcadey. Like, I played Modern Warfare 2 just to play Modern Warfare 2. Um, you know, I didn't play it to level up uh i maxed out all my guns right i unlocked everything in my guns already and i was still playing like that game was just overall fun it it was arcadey and i think that's what call of duty like doesn't have anymore um but um i was just thinking about yeah like that was like the last time like i just played for fun like it will i wasn't looking into like leveling up uh, or any progression or anything um but I, it revolves around the other aspect of playing with friends or playing with others right or being more skill set or whatever or you know or i guess it could be progressing yourself to get better but you know a game that i i i think tried to do that despite like everything going against it was uh Jedi Fallen Order. Mm, you're, yeah. You know, I'm I, I know I'm playing I I'm God, I sound like a oh I am kind of a fucking generic ass gamer. But um it it's a game that has no multiplayer. There was no intent for multiplayer. Uh, it's a solid game period, but it's like mm. it's just a good game. Yes. I, you know that's what, what I hear. I haven't played it. It's it's fun. I mean, the the gameplay I think could be I think a little more engaging and you know enjoyable. But I mean, it's like still, mm-hmm. I wouldn't take that over like a Star Wars MMO or like a Star Wars first person thing that just milks me of all my enjoyment of it. I'm already at that point where it's like Star Wars is whatever. But like, I enjoy a good couple of Star Wars games. Mm-hmm. and like I think most of them are because they're either like old style multiplayer games that don't monetize everything or have seasons or they're just story based games yeah. god damn you know what I'm gonna share my screen yeah, we're totally going off topic right now. This this podcast is fucking done. <laughs> but hold on, hold on. Just because we were talking about it earlier. Oh god, not caps locks. Um, hold on. Uh, no. Oh yeah, here we go. Is this it? 
looking. I don't see anything. Hold on. Damn, I'm trying to find the right one, man. But let's just go with this. Yeah, I'm going to try. I know how to work Discord. You shut your mouth. <laughs> See that? 18 and up. Peggy, okay. 18. Can you hear that? Uh, no. No, please turn it up so it's like super loud on your end. <laughs> I just remember seeing this for the first time. For those of you who don't know, ladies and gentlemen, we're watching the first trailer for Fall in New Vegas. <laughs> I'm just curious because I haven't seen this in a long time. Seeing a hand in a grave, a mass grave, sitting around. It pulls out, things are illuminated. The moon creeps into view. Las Vegas strip is visible amidst the tumbling dunes of the things. Yes. Postman Kevin Costner. War. War never changes. So good. New Vegas. It's good stuff. Seriously. It is. Fall twenty ten. Holy shit. I was like five back then. <laughs> I... 28. It's been so long and so fast. What? I was living... I was already living in Walnut Creek. That was the first year I moved to Walnut Creek. Mm -hmm. And I remember I bought the game. And I play the shit out of it. Forever changed. <laughs> right. I'm trying to find to see if there's the. Uh... Oh, I think this is it. This is what I was thinking of. The uh, the intro. Where it's like uh, the sniper blowing that dude's head off. God, and the music in this fucking game is so good. I love that our one listener is just going to be like, Oh, that's great that you guys are watching things. <laughs> yeah, I want to be, I want to be involved. We're looking at the strip. The camera's pulling out. Things don't quite look the same as how we would normally expect them. Oh, wait, that's because it's not... The postman. Oh, that one is really traveling. Oh man, that guy's brain got blown out. Yeah. See, this is this is the kind of content I like. You remember last week I was saying like I hate if we ever get popular. Not that we would, right. but if we do, and we have to like turn the fun out of this. I like how it's like there aren't enough people listening to care that uh, you and I are just watching a regular fucking video without anyone knowing. So good. Yeah. And there's Benny just burying the fucking body or having the cons do it. Those who survived did so in great oh god, we're, I don't think we're gonna watch this whole thing. I just want to watch that part. <laughs> oh god, what is that? That's not... Three blue women. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm just sharing that. All right, stop watching me. <laughs> I'm naked. <laughs> I'm necky. Alrighty. Uh, I think it's a good time to call it. Are you sure? I was really liking the the decay of of modern gaming. <laughs> we can continue that next week. Good, 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 good. I'm gonna hold yeah. you to it. Sounds good. All right, buddy. All right, let's All right, do sir. this fucking outro. We're gonna get this right, okay? Yep. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right, folks. You know the drill. If you want to tell us how shitty we are, you can hit us up on our email, hitting the mark twenty twenty at gmail dot com. Yeah. Give yeah. us any any ideas, any critiques, any crevasses, any molasses. I don't know what I'm saying. Anywho, you can also check us out on our Twitter, uh, Harry loves to we can't get him to shut up on twitter it is capital h capital e t capital m underscore podcast htm underscore podcast uh we also have a youtube account where you can listen to all of our previous podcasts that's all amounts of them uh it's again you're gonna find this really surprising hitting the mark with harry and mark hmm. If there's anything you guys would like to talk about, anything you want to hear, any kind of formats or ways that you, we could like change or differ without sacrificing who we are, you just message us and we'll happily ignore you. Thank you, folks. Thank you for tuning by for uh, hitting Mark with Harry and Mark. We look forward to talking again next week and you listening to us for some reason. Bye-bye. Auf Wiedersehen, assholes.